And we will pray over them, and we'll pray over you, and then we'll kick you out of the church building so that you can get home and get ready for your party for your house and your neighborhood and your front yard. So it's going to be an awesome time. That's kind of coming up. Also, last Sunday, um, it, we had um, some flyers that had names of kids with their jacket sizes, and we asked that you would participate in buying jackets. These are foster kids, kids that are in the foster system, more specifically in the foster organization that, that it, we support as a church. And so some of you took those, actually all of them were taken. So if you took one of those uh, names with a jacket, a jacket size that you are buying, we would love for you to bring them back by October 31st or November 7th. If you didn't let Claudia know that you took one of those and you took one and you just got out of here on church on Sunday, please let Claudia know. She's not here today, so just let me know if you want to let me know and I'll write down the name of the, the kid that you took. Just we want to keep some accountability there to make sure every kid is accounted for. If you didn't take one and you still want to buy a jacket for a kid uh, because it gets really cold, as you can tell today, um, um, uh, please let me know because we do we can find we can find kids who need jackets, um, but we do have a list of other kids that we can give you names to. So um, if you didn't if you didn't participate in that, um, lastly two things uh, that I want to throw your way, um, and and I don't know if I can do this, but I'm just going to take the liberty to do this. Um, Tuesday nights, our women have been meeting together in this space, going through a study through the book of Jude. Um, if you are coming, I'm, I'm super glad that you're a part of it. Um, I hope it's been refreshing. We've been praying for that time. But if you haven't come yet, this is only week four. I mean, just show up. Um, uh, Eve, what, or what time do you guys? Is it six, seven o'clock? Seven o'clock Tuesday nights in this front space. Just come and hang out if you haven't already. Men, we've got something for you too. And this requires like some discipline. But we want you to be disciplined. And we want you here. 6 a.m. every Wednesday morning. 6 a.m. Ben pointed out. Ben comes at 5.30. And we hang out. But 6 a.m. in that front space. We drink coffee. And it's good coffee. Some debate that. But it's good coffee. Uh, and we read, we're going through my utmost for his highest. We're taking it day at a time. Um, because, man, we're just not as sharp as the ladies. So we're just one, one day at a time. Um, but uh, coffee, 6 a.m., this front room. If you can make it, if you can make everyone, that's great. If you could just come once in a while, just come hang out. It's a great time. Uh, but 6 a.m. So those are the two ways. We would just love for you to get connected. And hopefully the prayer is that those are just vehicles for us to be in relationship with one another. Um, and so I hope that that just is exactly what happens. And so, awesome. Uh, hey, we're in a study through the book of Corinthians. So as you get your Bibles ready, your mobile devices ready to turn to 1 Corinthians, I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 3 today. So pray with me and turn there at the same time, which we can do that. Father God, thank you for your word. God, would we not take for granted that we can freely carry our Bibles, that we can freely open our Bibles, that we have your word, our Bible, so accessible. It's on our mobile devices. It's always in front of us. God, we seek to jump in as a group of people looking for you, looking for order in this chaotic world that we live in, looking for healing in this broken world that we're living in, and we're looking for you, Jesus. And so would we find you today in your word? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, if this is your first Sunday, we started a series through the book of 1 Corinthians, which is, uh, we've got five weeks left. Um, which then will get us into the four Sundays of Advent, which then will get us into 2022. It is here. So welcome. I'm just going to welcome you. Welcome to 2022. It's going to be here soon. Um, I just want to be the first person to say greetings from 2022. I'm excited because we have said this about the book of 1 Corinthians. I shared the story about going in June to South Carolina, and in South Carolina, I saw these cement blocks or these, these rocks that were shaped into blocks, stepping, carriage stepping stones, these assistants that were used to get into the carriages when they used horse and buggy. 
1 Corinthians serves the same purpose for me and for you as we seek to be organized in our gathering as a group of people called the church. And the truth is, the church then in Corinth and the church today in 2021, at the cusp of 2022, is in the same mess today as they were then. And Paul has some bold words to that church. And Paul has some bold words for us today as a church. We looked last week that he says, hey, you are to be unified. Like, stop grumbling against one another. Stop seeking to see whose team that you're on. How many of you like college football? Okay, good. Almost everyone, right? I love, I said, spoke to this, I love college football, not because of necessarily the games, but I love that most college football teams, and there's probably like four of them storied, tradition teams, that don't put the names on the back of their jerseys. Because it's all about the name and the front of the jersey. And that's what Paul is saying in this moment. It's not about you individually. But rather, as an individual, you get to be a part of something corporate that is so special. And that is my church. So be in unison with one another. Like this doesn't sell seats to Alma Heights Baptist Church, but it's not about Alma Heights Baptist Church. I had somebody this week introduce me to somebody else, like, hey, this is Bobby, and he is the pastor at First Baptist Church, Alma Heights. I was like, what? No, I'm not. First of all, there's no such thing as that First Baptist, Alma Heights. <laughs> Just Alma Heights, right? I don't know why that's so uncomfortable for me, but it is. It's not about the back of the jersey. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing here. And he's doing something awesome and special. And the truth is, is each and every one of us walk in here hurting and broken and seeking something. And it's not me. It's him and his word. So be in unison. Be in step with one another in that. Church in Corinth. And church at Alma Heights Baptist Church. Not First Baptist Alma Heights. So we see that played out. It's, inter it's interesting. There are two ways that people come to meet Jesus in the New Testament. Like in the Gospels and then in Acts specifically, there are really two different ways that people encounter G Jesus and encounter the faith, encounter hope in the Messiah, Jesus. The first is this, sermons. When people come in, sit down, gather, and they hear the gospel presented, taught to them. And the second is this, an intentional flip. And, and, and like if we just look at some examples here in Matthew chapter 5, um, we see the first way. Uh, this is um, Jesus sitting down at the Sermon on the Mount, speaking to people. And he begins, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. This is Jesus preaching, speaking, teaching to the crowd. We, I read this this morning in our volunteer meeting. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 10. It says this, When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. And then they, he took them, Jesus took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a, call, a town called Bethesda. But the crowds learned about it, and they followed him, and Jesus welcomed the crowd. And then he talked to them. And then he fed them in this moment, too. Jesus taught the crowds. Acts chapter 2, we also see this. Peter addresses the crowd at Pentecost. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet knew that God had promised him an oath. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. Peter is teaching in this moment to the crowd. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. He put the gospel message, the resurrection message, on display to the crowd by teaching it. P. 
People came to Jesus by hearing sermons, hearing teachings, by gathering together. Same might be true for you. You may have gathered to a place at some point in your life. Man, I have this vivid memory of fourth grade Bobby. Like, I have very vivid memories of, like, my childhood. But there's this one moment in time when I was in the fourth grade that my parents did the best things ever. First, I say things, because they bought me a snow cone. And I'm eating a snow cone in this moment at the tailgate of my dad's truck at 10312 Luella. It's a house that they bought that I grew up in from fourth grade on. The reason why this is such a significant moment in time for me was that my parents moved us to a new location. It was a new season, but the best thing wasn't the snow cone or the tailgate or the house. The best thing was that my parents had just accepted Jesus, and we as a family began this new journey in a group of people called the church. It was like this new moment in time for me, and I'm here today because of that moment that I vividly remember when we gathered together to hear the teaching and the preaching of the gospel message that changes our lives. But the truth is, it's not always the case. It also happens where we have this intentional flip. Maybe you resonate with an intentional flip. Mark chapter 2, we see one of them. A few days later, Jesus enters Capernaum, and the people heard that Jesus had come. And they gathered, right? Because they know that when they gather, Jesus is going to teach. They gathered in such a large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and so he preached to them the word. Some men bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, digging through it, and then lowered the man through the roof. And it was in that moment, if you're familiar with this passage, that this individual, this paralyzed, broken-bodied man, lowered in front of Jesus through the roof, had an intentional flip where Jesus says, Hey, your sins are forgiven. I don't know if the paralyzed man responded the way that you and I would have responded, maybe. I didn't come here to have my sins forgiven. I came here to walk. But the intentional flip was that Jesus forgave him. Spiritually, he would no longer be broken or paralyzed. So get up off your mat and walk, then, Jesus mentions. That intentional flip may be our story. Maybe that's your story this morning, coming in to be healed of something physically. But the truth is, is may we walk out of here healed, intentionally flipped spiritually, with brokenness that we face. And still walking out with a limp, knowing that we can still get up and go. There was another intentional flip. One of my favorites in Acts chapter 8. The angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian. An Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man, this Ethiopian, reading from Isaiah. And Philip asks, do you understand what you're reading? How can I? The man says, unless someone explains it to me. And so Philip invited him to sit, and here's where the intentional flip happens. The passage that he was reading was Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. He was like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants from his life was taken from him? Philip began to express and speak the gospel message about this one that this Isaiah passage was speaking of. To Ethiopia and beyond, if you will, happened at this intentional flip. The Ethiopian says, hey, uh, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? So both 
Philip and the Ethiopian go down into the water. Philip baptizes the Ethiopian. And immediately as he comes out of the water, Philip disappears. That's an intentional flip. Maybe for you. That's the case. Maybe for you it was... I mean, I was going to read Paul's intentional flip. We know it on the road to Damascus. He was literally knocked off a horse and blinded for three days. Maybe, just maybe, you were literally knocked off whatever you needed to be knocked off. And it hurt. But in that hurt came healing by the Messiah, by Jesus. In the letter to this Corinthians to this church in Corinth, Paul takes it a step further and he speaks to three people. Not three like individuals, but three specific people that are living there in Corinth, which, if we're extremely honest, is the same three type of people living here and maybe even in this room today. And so if you're at 1 Corinthians, we're going to be at the end of 1 Corinthians 2 to really lead us into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm just going to give you the answers already. The three types of people that Paul is going to speak to here are the natural people. These natural people have no belief in the gospel message, in Jesus. Then there are the spiritual people. And these spiritual people, what? They have belief in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have faith in Him. And then as we jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's going to speak to the people of the flesh or the carnal people. And so read with me starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And then verse 15, the person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who, know, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct them? But we have, or those that are the spiritual people, have the mind of Christ. The natural, the spiritual. Chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers and sisters. <coughs> we awkwardly pause there. Because he's about to speak to us in this moment. Brothers and sisters. I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, verse 3 says. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among, among you, are you not worldly? And then look at this question. And highlight, circle, square, underline, do whatever you need to do right here. Are you not acting like mere humans? Look to the person next to you and just say, man, you're acting like a human. Okay, you're, you're scared to do it. Just do it. Come on, look at the person on the other side then and say, you're acting like a human. We got those that are natural in this moment, in this church, then and now. Those that have no belief, no faith, no conviction to the gospel. We have those that are of the Spirit. Those that from the scattering in Acts at Pentecost, who 3,000 were added to that day at Pentecost. And they, they had hearts that were stirred so much so that in hearing the gospel message, um, Acts 2 says they were cut to the heart. What shall we do? Repent, have faith, believe, be baptized. And they were scattered. They, they were persecuted. So they went all over to the known world. Ethiopia and beyond in this moment. In the life of the followers of Jesus. Living in an invigorated faith. A growing faith. A, a heart shaped, molded, maturing. 
Those are, those are the Spirit. And then Paul, as we spoke to last week, last week, Chloe's people told on you. We read that in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. So Chloe's people tell me, you're not in unison with one another at the church. Some are saying, like, I like Apollos, I like Paul, I follow Peter, and those of you that are high and mighty, I follow only Jesus. And then Paul, in that moment, downshifts and looks us straight in the eyeballs and says, hey, brothers and sisters, some of you say you're spiritual, but you're not living it. And this is how he can tell. You're still sucking on the bottle. Like you're only drinking milk. Like I, I can only give you milk. You're not ready for food. Does that hurt your feelings? Because it hurts mine a bit. Because I'm not immune to this one bit. Like none of us in this room, whether you were fourth grade eating snow cones because your parents now believe in Jesus, or whatever your faith journey looks like, or however long you've been at Alamo Heights Baptist Church, or whatever church for that matter, or whether you came to the Jude Bible study or at 5.30 in the morning with the men's coffee or not, none of us are immune to this looking deep into our hearts and saying, where do I fall, Paul? Where am I today? I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are worldly. Uh, some of your translations might say you, you are carnal. We get this carnal people, carnal sin, right? Doesn't mean that these are carnivores, right? No, it just means that you're living and being driven and guided by your flesh. And how's that working out for you, Paul's asking. Because to me, it only looks like you're mere humans. Ah, it stings a bit, doesn't it? I think of Romans 6 in this moment, and, and you don't necessarily have to turn there. But, but Paul writes to those in Rome, and he writes to us, and he writes to those in Corinth too these same words. Romans 6, starting verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Like, should we sing the three songs, pray, high five, fist bump, elbow bump each other, and walk out of here and just keep on sinning? By no means, exclamation point, Paul writes in verse 2 of Romans 6. We are those who have died to sin. I, I pray this with EJ and Courtney and Gabrielle when we rehearse every Sunday morning. Would we not take for granted the lyrics or the words that we are singing during our song? Do you realize the words that we just sang? Like the anthem that we sang is this very message. That we are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? That means how can we live in sin any longer if we have died to it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore then buried with him through the baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, hear this, friends, we too may live. I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> We too may live. So live life already. For we have been united with him in death like this. We are certainly also united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by the body ruled by sin might be done away. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
Because anyone who has died has been set free. Brothers and sisters, Paul speaks to us as close friends. There's something different about us in Christ. Before church in Corinth, before church here in this community, before we address some real issues, and we're getting, so uh, next week, if you want to read ahead, 4, 5, and 6, chapters 4, 5, and 6, and we're going to get thick into some issues that the church then is facing and the church today is facing. But like I said last week, before we even get there, we must be united with each other through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or we aren't going to answer anything. On our own, we are so lost, we are so broken, we are so helpless. But together in Christ, what's stopping us? What's stopping us, not for the sake of us to pat ourselves on the back, but what's stopping us to affect positively for the gospel's sake the communities the households the workplaces the schools that we go into starting tomorrow nothing is stopping us from making that kind of impact paul doesn't leave us hanging thank goodness he doesn't leave us hanging look at uh, chapter uh, 3 verse 5 he he goes back a bit what after all is apollos for those of you that say i follow apollos what is Apollos? And what is Paul? For those of you who say that you were baptized by Paul, you raise your hand and baptized by Paul, great. What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Verse 6, and this may be a familiar verse for you if you've been in church any, any amount of time. I planted the seed, Apollo watered, but God makes it grow. God makes you grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, because they're united, remember, we are united, and they will be each rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. And then again, underline, circle, square, highlight, you are God's field, God is building. Like, I'm encouraged to hear that this morning. I hope you are too. Like somebody should write a song. If you are good at writing lyrics or poems or song, God is, you are the field, God is building. I want to I hear it next week. So somebody write it. <coughs> Verse 10. By the grace God has given me, Paul speaking here. I have laid the foundation as a wise builder. Your translation may say as an expert builder. I have laid the foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building it. But each one should build with care. Paul, taking a few hints from Jesus' words in his Sermon on the Mount here, right? Like we know. Like the foundation is set. And if you've lived in San Antonio long enough, you know that it's not a very good foundation. Terrible foundations in San Antonio. There are companies that fix foundations. Paul's doing the work here to fix our foundation. Corporately as Alma Heights Baptist Church, and individually, you and me. And there's only two options. Right? Wise or foolish builders. That's it. Jesus speaks to it in Matthew chapter 7. Wise or foolish. Build on the rock, build on sand. You choose. The rains, the storms, it's coming. It has come. You've seen the effects of it. Are you wise or are you foolish? Physically, we've felt this. Spiritually, we've felt this. And so Paul is calling us back to this. Saying, 
we should build with care. Verse 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is who? There is no option for us to choose a different foundation. Like, let's just be honest. There's no option. We know the right foundation. Why choose another? Why choose ourselves? Why choose someone else? Something else? There's one foundation. It's Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, six things there. Verse 13 says, Their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. A day of judgment will come, Paul speaking to where what we build on will matter at that moment. The materials used to build on the foundation that is Jesus Christ will be refined in the fire. The things that don't matter, Paul is pointed to, will be burnt up. And it'll show how much of what material we use in our life. What we use to build on the foundation that is Jesus Christ of Mass. And at 1129, October 17th, what we choose here forward matters and makes all the difference. We see that in our families, within our spouses, within the relationships with our kids, relationships with our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates, our church mates. The materials that we use intentionally and authentically will make all the difference in the end. Paul reminds us something next here in verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Now, let me uh, fast forward a little bit and you know the end of the story too, maybe. Um, Layton gave us the task two weeks ago to read the whole book of Corinthians in one setting. Anybody take that to task this week? I'm glad he's not in here because he would be embarrassed. <laughs> At the end of the story of 1 Corinthians, we, it's been established that there are temples to false idols. Apollos, Aphrodite, where it is not good what's happening in those temples. But the end of the story is that those temples those idols that are being worshipped in those temples are eradicated eventually. And in those temples are worshipped to the one true God. What Paul is saying here is the same thing needs to happen in our hearts, in our bodies, with the idol worship that we are giving our hearts and our minds, our time and our energy and our resources to, must be getting rid of because the temple is here and God dwells in us. Make room for Him. Build on the foundation that is the temple of our lives today. Like, hear that loud and clear. The temple that is our body is a big deal. And maybe we should practice this. Like, turn to the person next to you and say, you're a big deal. Okay, you did that with so lack of enthusiasm. Okay, look to the person and say, you are a big deal. say this in closing. We must be certain. Bless you. We must be certain what we're building. And if you walked in here and it wasn't the foundation that is the only choice, the right choice that is Jesus Christ, may that be your commitment to build on from here on out. And the truth is it's a work. It's a lot of work. 
But as we gather, we know that you are not alone. We do it together. But each and every one of us are a piece of work. As brilliant as we are, we are a piece of work. Now, let me say this, too. In Christ, by God's grace, you become an expert builder. Paul's words here are, by God's grace, I'm a wise builder building. You, too, are a wise builder, an expert builder. Like, I'm not naive to know that you leave here and you have the opportunity to build within the relationships that God has given you. Spouses, parents, children, neighbors, classmates, co-workers. So as we live life in Him, would we allow ourselves and be open and commissioned to building as an expert and wise builder? together. If we don't, where we go from here on out in 1 Corinthians will be even more difficult. So we start there. Realizing our place in this. So I'm going to pray for us. Then I'm just going to just give it some time. And in the quietness and the stillness, I mean, even if you have to grab the hand of the person next to you, because you kind of like them. Call out, cry out to Him. Ask Him for strength and endurance as you leave here to live in Him and by grace to build. Because what He is doing in and through you. And so pray with me. Father God, I thank you for my friends in this room. God, if we leave Jesus out, we've got nothing. And so forgive us, heal us, mend us, shape us into your people. May we throw off the old, throw off the death, and live into life that is resurrection life from you, Jesus. Thank you for setting a level, strong, firm foundation that we all have the opportunity to build on. And would we build as wise, expert builders in you by your grace. And so, God, I pray for the dynamics, the context in in this room. Be with husbands and wives and parents and sons and daughters and grandkids. Be with the relationships that have been formed and will be formed. We pray for our communities. We pray for our schools and our jobs. That we would be you on display. And so God, it's in this moment that I ask that we would just give our hearts to you, that we would uh, speak to you, and that you would draw near to us as we draw near to you. God, what a brilliant day it is outside. So would we take full advantage of basking in it? Would we take full advantage of um, basking in your grace and forgiveness and living in the life that you've now called us to? Grant us more opportunities. Grant us more favor. Grant us 
more grace as we seek you, God. Would we be found by you and would we find you? So I thank you for those that are here. And God, we just take the posture and submitting that we need you. And so we look to you Monday and beyond and bring us back here Sunday that we may celebrate what you have done. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have said that in closing, and I think you turned the projector off. Did you turn it off? All right, would you stand with me? Uh, this will be our benediction. You won't necessarily read it with me because it's not up on the screen, but I'm going to read it to us on our way out of here. Um, so here it is, 1 Corinthians 13. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not have any envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, love keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth, love protects. Love always trusts, love always hopes, love always perseveres, love never fails. Have a super week. We'll see you soon. Have a great one. Bye.